Chapter 7 Walking along the muddy, rubbish-heaped central street of Gandhi Town, Dr. Mary Rittersdorf said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Clinically, it's mad. These people must all be hebephrenics, terribly, terribly deteriorated. Inside her, something cried at her to get out, to leave this place, and never return, to get back to Tara and her profession as marriage counselor, and forget she had ever seen this, and the idea of attempting psychotherapy with these people. She shuddered. Even drug therapy and electroshock would be of little use here. This was the tail end of mental illness, the point of no return. Beside her, the young CIA agent, Dan Mageboom, said, Your diagnosis, then, is hebephrenia. I can report that back officially. Taking her by the arm, he assisted her over the remains of some major animal carcass. In the midday sun, the ribs stuck up like tines of a great curved fork. Mary said, Yes, it's obvious. Did you see the pieces of dead rat lying strewn around the door of that shack? I'm sick. I'm actually sick to my stomach. No one lives that way now, not even in India and China. It's like going back 4,000 years. That's the way Synanthropus and Neanderthal must have lived, only without the rusted machinery. At the ship, Mageboom said, We can have a drink. No drink is going to help me, Mary said. You know what this awful place reminds me of. The horrible shoddy old Connapt my husband moved into when we separated. Beside her, Mageboom started, blinked. You knew I was married, Mary said. I told you. She wondered why her remark had surprised him so. On the trip, she had freely discussed her marital problems with him, finding him a good listener. I can't believe your comparison is accurate, Mageboom said. The conditions here are symptoms of a group psychosis. Your husband never lived like that. He had no mental disorder. He glared at her. Mary Halting said, How do you know? You never met him. Chuck was, still is sick. What I said is so... He has a latent streak of hebephrenia in him. He always shrank from socio-sexual responsibility. I told you about all my attempts to get him to seek employment that guaranteed a reasonable return. But of course, Mageboom himself was an employee of the CIA. She could hardly expect to obtain sympathy from him on that issue. Better perhaps to drop the whole topic. Things were depressing enough without having to rehash her life with Chuck. On both sides of her, Hebes, that was what they called themselves, a corruption of the obviously accurate diagnostic category, Hebephrenic, gazed with vacuous silliness, grinning without comprehension even without real curiosity. A white goat wandered by ahead of her. She and Dan Mageboom stopped warily, neither of them familiar with goats. It passed on. At least she thought these people are harmless. Hebephrenics, at all their stages of deterioration, lacked the capacity to act out aggression. There were other far more ominous derangement syndromes to be on the lookout for. 
it was inevitable that very shortly they would begin to turn up. She was thinking in particular of the manic depressives who, in their manic phase, could be highly destructive. But there was an even more sinister category which she was stealing herself against. The destructiveness of the manics would be limited to impulse. At the worst, it would have a tantrum-like aspect, temporary orgies of breaking and hitting, which ultimately would subside. However, with the acute paranoid, a sy systemized and permanent hostility could be anticipated. It would not abate in time. But on the contrary, would become more elaborate. The paranoid possessed an analytical, calculating quality. He had a good reason for his actions, and each move fitted in as part of the scheme. His hostility might be less conspicuously violent, but in the long run its durability posed deeper implications as far as therapy went, because with these people the advanced paranoids, cure or even temporary insight was virtually impossible. Like the hebephrenic, the paranoid had found a stable and permanent maladaption, and unlike the manic depressive and the hebephrenic, or the simple catatonic schizophrenic, the paranoid seemed rational. The formal pattern of logical reasoning appeared undisturbed. Underneath, however, the paranoid suffered from the greatest mental disfigurement possible for a human being. He was incapable of empathy, unable to imagine himself in another person's role. Hence, for him, others did not actually exist, except as objects in motion that did or did not affect his well-being. For decades, it had been fashionable to say that paranoids were incapable of loving. This was not so. The paranoid experienced love fully, both as something given to him by others and as a feeling on his part toward them. But there was a slight catch to this. The paranoid experienced it as a variety of hate. To Dan Mageboom, she said, According to my theory, the several subtypes of mental illness should be functioning on this world as classes, somewhat like those of ancient India. These people here, the hebephrenics, would be equivalent to the untouchables. The manics would be the warrior class without fear, one of the highest, samurai, Mage Boom said, as in Japan. Yes, she nodded. The paranoids, actually paranoic schizophrenics, would function as the statesman class. They'd be in charge of developing political ideology and social programs. They'd have the overall world view. The simple schizophrenics, she pondered, they'd correspond to the poet class, although some of them would be religious visionaries, as would be some of the Hebes. The Hebes, however, would be inclined to produce as sectic saints, whereas the schizophrenics would produce dogmatists. 
those with polymorphic schizophrenia simplex would be the creative members of the society producing the new ideas. She tried to remember what other categories might exist. There could be some with overvalent ideas, psychotic disorders that were advanced forms of milder obsessive-compulsive neurosis, the so-called diencephalic disturbances. Those people would be the clerks and office holders of the society, the ritualistic functionaries with no original ideas. The conservatis their conservatism would balance the radical quality of the polymorphic schizophrenics and give the society stability. Mageboom said, so one would think the whole affair would work. He gestured, how would it differ from our own society on Terra? For a time she considered the question. It was a good one. No answer, Mageboom said. I have an answer. Leadership in this society here would naturally fall to the paranoids. They'd be superior individuals in terms of initiative, intelligence, and just plain innate ability. Of course, they'd have trouble keeping the manics from staging a coup. There'd always be tension between the two classes. But you see, with paranoids establishing the ideology, the dominant emotional theme would be hate. Actually hate going in two directions. The leadership would hate everyone outside its enclave and also would take for granted that everyone hated it in return. Therefore, their entire so-called foreign policy would be to establish mechanisms by which this supposed hatred directed at them could be fought. And this would involve the entire society in an illusory struggle, a battle against foes that didn't exist for a victory over nothing. Why is that so bad? Because, she said, no matter how it came out, the results would be the same. Total isolation for these people. That would be the ultimate effect of their entire group activity, to progressively cut themselves off from all other living entities. Is that so bad, to be self-sufficient? No, Mary said. It wouldn't be self-sufficiency. It would be something entirely different, something you and I really can't imagine. Remember the old experiments made with people in absolute isolation back in the mid-20th century, when they anticipated space travel, the possibility of a man being entirely alone for days, weeks on end, with fewer and fewer stimuli. Remember the results they obtained when they placed a man in a chamber from which no stimuli at all reached him. Of course, Mageboom said, it's what now is called the boogies. The result of stimulus deprivation is acute hallucinosis. She nodded, auditory, visual, tactile, and olfactory hallucinosis, replacing the missing stimuli, and an intensity, hallucinosis can exceed the force of reality, in its vividness, its impact, the effect aroused by it, for example, states of terror, drug-induced hallucinations can bring on states of terror which no experience with the real world 
can produce. Why? Because they have an absolute quality. They are generated within the sense receptor system and constitute a feedback emanating not from a distant point but from within a person's own nervous system. He can't obtain detachment from it, and he knows it. There's no retreat possible. Mageboom said, and how's that going to act here? You don't seem able to say. I can say, but it's not simple. First, I don't know yet how far this society is advanced along the lines of isolating itself and the individuals who make it up. We'll know soon by their attitude toward us. The heaves we are seeing here, she indicated the hovels on both sides of the muddy road. Their attitude is no index. However, when we run into our first paranoids or manics, let's say this, undoubtedly some measure of hallucination or psychological projection exists as a component of their world view. In other words, we have to assume they're already partly hallucinating, but they still retain some sense of objective reality. As such, our presence here will accelerate the hallucinating tendency. We have to face that and be prepared, and the hallucination will take the form of seeing us as elements of dire menace. We, our ship, will literally be viewed, I don't mean interpreted, I mean actually perceived as threatening. What they undoubtedly will see in us is an invading spearhead that intends to overthrow their society, make it a satellite of our own. But that's true. We intend to take the leadership out of their hands, place them back where they were 25 years ago. Patients in enforced hospitalization circumstances. In other words, captivity. It was a good point, but not quite good enough she said, there is a distinction you're not making. It's a slender one, but vital. We will be attempting therapy of these people, trying to put them actually in the position which, by accident, they now improperly hold. If our program is successful, they will govern themselves as legitimate settlers on this moon eventually. First, a few, then more and more of them. This is not a form of captivity, even if they imagine it, it is. The moment any person on this moon is free of psychosis, is capable of viewing reality without the distortion of projection. Do you think it'll be possible to persuade these people voluntarily to resume their hospitalized status. No, Mary said, we'll have to bring force to bear on them. With the possible exception of a few heaves, we're going to have to take out commitment papers for an entire planet. She corrected herself, or rather Moon. Just think, Mageboom said, if you hadn't changed that to Moon, I'd have grounds for committing you. Startled, she glanced at him. He did not appear to be joking. His youthful face was grim. It was just a slip, she said. A slip, he agreed, but a revealing one. A symptom, he smiled, and it was a cold smile. It made her shiver in bewilderment and unease. What did Mage Boom have against her, or was she becoming just a little bit paranoid? perhaps too, but she felt enormous hostility directed her way from the man, and she barely knew him. And she had felt this hostility throughout the trip, and strangely from the very beginning, 
It had started the moment they met, putting the Daniel Mageboom simulacrum on homeostasis. Chuck Rittersdorf switched himself out of the circuit, rose stiffly from the seat before the control panel, and lit a cigarette. It was 9 p.m. local time. On Alpha 3 M2, the sim would go about its business, functioning in an adequate manner. If any crisis came up, Petrie could take over. In the meantime, he himself had other problems. It was time for him to produce his first script for the comic, Bunny Hintman, his other employer. He had now a supply of stimulants. The slime mold from Ganymede had presented them to him as he had started from his conapt that morning. So evidently he could count on working all night. But first there was a little matter of dinner. For what it was worth, he paused at the public vidphone booth in the lobby of the CIA building and put in a call to Joan Triest Conat. Hi, she said, when she saw who it was. Listen, Mr. Hentman called here, trying to get hold of you, so you better get in touch with him. He said he tried to reach you at the CIA building in San Francisco, but they said they never heard of you. Policy, Chuck said. Okay, I'll call him. He asked her, then, about dinner. I don't believe you'll be able to have dinner, with or without me, Joan answered. From what Mr. Hintman told me, he's got some idea he wants you to listen to. He says when he springs it on you, you'll drop. Chuck said, that wouldn't come as a surprise. He felt resigned. Obviously, this was how the entire relationship with Hintman would function. Temporarily forgetting any further efforts, in Joan's direction he called the vidphone number, which the Hintman organization had provided him. Rittersdorf, Hintman exclaimed, as soon as the contact was established, Where are you? Get right over here. I'm in my Florida apt. Take an express rocket. I'll pay the fare. Listen, Rittersdorf, your test is showing up right now. This'll tell if you're any good or not. It was a long leap from the vacuous dump-like settlement of the Hebes on Alpha 3 M2 to Bunny Hentman's energetic schemes. The transition was going to be hard, perhaps it could be accomplished on the flight back east. He could eat, too, on the ship, but that let out. Joan Triest, already his job was undermining his personal life. Tell me the idea now, so I can mull it over on the flight. Hentman's eyes glowed with cunning. Are you kidding? Suppose someone overhears. Listen, Rittersdorf. I'll give you a hint. I had this in the back of my mind when I hired you, but... His grin increased. I didn't want to scare you off. You know what I mean. Now, I got you hooked. He laughed loudly. So now, wow, anything goes, right? Just tell me the idea, Chuck said patiently. Lowering his voice to a whisper, Hentman leaned close to his vid scanner. His nose, magnified, filled the screen, a nose and one winking, delighted eye. It's a new characterization I'm going to add to my repertoire. George Fleib, that's his name. As soon as I tell you what he is, you'll see why I hired you. Listen, Fleib is a CIA agent, and he's posing as a female marriage counselor. In order to get information on suspects, Hentman waited expectantly. Well, what you say? After a long time, Chuck said, It's the worst thing I've heard in 20 years. 
It completely depressed him. You're out of your mind, I know, and you don't. This could be the biggest character in TV comedy since Red Skelton's Freddy the Freeloader. And you're the one to write the script because you've had the experience. So get here to my app as soon as possible and we'll get started on the first George Fleeb episode. All right, if that's not such a hot idea, what have you got to offer? Chuck said, what about a female marriage counselor who poses as a CIA agent in order to get information that'll cure her patients? Are you pulling my leg? In fact, Chuck said, how about this, a CIA simulacrum? You're putting me on. Hintman's face became red. At least on the vid screen, it darkened appreciably. I was never more serious in my life. All right, what about the simulacrum? This CIA simulacrum, C. Chuck said, poses as a female marriage counselor. See? But every now and then, the simulacrum breaks down. Do the CIA sims really do that? Break down? All the time. Go on, Hintman said, scowling. Chuck said, See, the whole point is, what the hell does a simulacrum know about human marital problems? And see, here it is advising people. It keeps giving out this advice. Once it gets started, it can't stop. It's even giving marital advice to the general dynamics repairmen, who are always fixing it, see? Rubbing his chin, Hintman nodded slowly. Hmm, there'd have to be a particular reason why this one sim acts this way. So, we'd go into his origin. The episode, C would start with the General Dynamics engineers who... I've got it, Hintman interrupted. This one engineer, call him Frank Fopp, is having trouble in his marriage. He's seeing a marriage counselor, and she's given him this document. It's an analysis of his problem, and he's brought it to work, to GD's labs, with him. And there's this new sim standing there, waiting to be programmed. Sure, Chuck said. And, and Fup reads the document aloud to this other engineer, call him Phil Grook. The simulacrum gets accidentally programmed. It thinks it's a marriage counselor, but actually it's been contracted for by the CIA. It's shipped to the CIA, and it shows up. Hintman paused, pondering. Where would it show up? Rittersdorf, behind the Iron Curtain, say, in Red Canada. Right, in Red Canada, in Ontario. It's supposed to pose as a synthetic wobble hide salesman. Isn't that right? Isn't that what they do? More or less right. But instead, Hintman went on excitedly. It sets itself up in a little office, hangs out a shingle George Flybe, psychologist. Ph.D. Marital Counseling, and these high-commie party officials with marital problems keep coming to it. Hentman puffed with agitation. Rittersdorf, you've got the best frigging idea I've heard in a long time, as I can remember. And... And always, these two General Dynamics engineers, they're showing up, trying to tinker with it, and get it working, right? Listen, 
get on the express rocket for Florida right now and sketch this out during the trip. Maybe have some dialogue when you get here. I think we're really on to something. You know, your brain and mine really synchronize right. I think so, Chuck said. I'll be right there. He obtained the address and then rang off. Wearily, he left the vidphone booth. He felt drained, and he could not for the life of him tell if had come up with a good idea or not. Anyhow, Hentman believed he had, and evidently that was what counted. By jet cab, he reached the San Francisco spaceport. There he boarded an express rocket, which would carry him to Florida. The Conapt building of Bunny Hentman was luxury incarnate. All its levels were below the surface, and it had its own uniformed police force patrolling the entrances and halls. Chuck gave his name to the first cop, who approached him, and a moment later he was descending to Bunny's floor. Within the huge apt, Bunny Hentman lounged in a hand-dyed Martian spider silk dressing gown, smoking a green, enormous Tampa, Florida cigar. He jerked his head in impatient greeting to Chuck, and then indicated the other men in the living room. Rittersdorf, there are two of your colleagues, my writers. This tall one, he pointed with his cigar. That's Calv Dark. Dark approached Chuck slowly and shook hands. And the short, fat one with no hair on his head. That's my senior writer, Thursday Jones. Also coming forward, Jones. An alert, sharp-featured Negro shook hands with Chuck. Both the riders seemed friendly. He had no sense of hostility on their parts. Evidently, they did not resent him. Dark said, Sit down, Rittersdorf. It's been a long trip for you, a drink. No, Chuck said. <clears throat> He wanted his mind clear for the session ahead. You had dinner on the rocket, Hintman asked. Yes, I've been telling my boys about your idea, Hintman said. Both of them like it. Fine, Chuck said. However, Hintman continued. They've batted it back and forth, and a little while ago, they came up with an evolution of their own. You know what I mean. Chuck said, I'd be only too happy to hear their idea based on my idea. Clearing his throat, Thursday Jones, <coughs> Jones said, Mr. Rittersdorf, could a simulacrum commit a murder? After staring at him a moment, Chuck said, I don't know. He felt cold. You mean, on its own, working by Atomic? I mean, could the person operating it from remote use it as an instrument for murder? To Bunny Hentman, Chuck said, I don't see any humor in an idea like that, and my wits supposed to be more bound. Wait, Bunny cautioned, you forget the famous old funny thrillers, combinations of terror and humor, like The Cat and the Canary, that movie with Paulette Goddard and Bob Hope, and, <clears throat> and the famous Arsenic and Old Lace, not to mention classic British comedies 
in which someone was murdered. There were dozens of them in the past, like the marvelous kind hearts and coronets, Thursday Jones said. I see, Chuck said, and that was all he said. He kept his mouth shut. While inside, he seethed with disbelief and shock. Was this just some malign coincidence, this idea running parallel to his own life? Or, and this seemed more probable, the slime mold had said something to Bunny. <clears throat> but if so... Why was the Hentman organization doing this? What interest did they have in the life and death of Mary Rittersdorf? Hentman said, I think the boys have a good idea here. This scary with the, well, you see, Chuck, you work for CIA, so you don't realize this, but the average person is scared of the CIA. You got it? He regards it as a secret interplanetary police and spy organization, which I know Chuck said, well, you don't have to bite my head off, Bunny Hentman said, with a glance at Dark and Jones. Speaking up, Dark said, Chuck, if I can call you that already, we know <clears throat> our business. When the average Joe thinks of a CIA sim, he's scared right off the bat. When you gave Bunny your idea, you weren't thinking of that. Now here's this CIA operator. Let's call him. He turned to Jones. What's our working name? Siegfried Trotz. Here's Ziggy Trotz, a secret agent, trench coat made of Uranian mole cricket fur, hat of Venusian wubfuzz, pulled down over his forehead, all that standing in the rain on some dismal moon, maybe one of Jupiter's, a familiar sight. And then Chuck Jones said, picking up the narrative. Once the pick is established in the viewer's mind, the stereotype you see, then the viewer discovers something about Ziggy Trotz he didn't know, that the stereotype of the sinister CIA agent doesn't ordinarily contain. Dark said, See, Ziggy Trotz is an idiot, a nerd who can never pull off anything right. And <clears throat> here, here's what he's trying to pull off. He walked over, seated himself on the couch beside Chuck. He's going to try to commit a murder. Got it? Yes, Chuck said tightly, saying as little as possible, becoming merely a listening entity. He shrank within in himself, more and more bewildered, by and suspicious of what was going on around him. Dark continued, now who's he trying to kill? He glanced at Jones and Bunny Hentman. We, we've been arguing about this part, Bunny said, a blackmailer, an international jewel magnet who operates from another planet entirely, maybe a non-T. Shutting his eyes, Chuck rocked back and forth. What's wrong, Chuck? Dark asked. He's thinking, Bunny said, trying the idea on. Right, Chuck. That's right, Chuck managed to say. He was sure now that Lord Running Clam had gone to Hintman, and something vast and dismal was unfolding around him. Catching him up, he was a midge in the midst of this, whatever it was, and there was no way for him to get out. I disagree, Dark said, 
international jewel magnet who's maybe a Martian or a Venusian. That's not bad, but, he gestured, it's been done to death. We started with one stereotype. Let's not revert to another. I think he should be trying to do away with, well, his wife, Dark, looked around at each of them. Tell me, what's wrong with that? He's got a nagging shrew of a wife. Get the picture? This hard, tough, CIA, secret police spy type agent who the average person is scared to death of. We see how tough he is, pushing people around, and then he goes home, and he's got this wife who pushes him around. He laughed. It's not bad, Bunny admitted, but it's not enough, and I wonder how many times I could do the characterization. I want something I can add permanently to the show, not just a skit for one week. I think the henpecked CIA man could go on forever, Dark said. Anyhow, he turned back to Chuck. So this Ziggy Trotz is next seen on the job at CIA headquarters, and there's all these police gadgets and electronic devices, and all of a sudden it comes to him. Dark jumped to his feet and began striding about the room. He can use them against his wife. And then, to top it off, in steps this new sim, Dark's voice became metallic and crabbed as he mimicked a simulacrum. Yes, Master, what may I do for you? I am waiting. Bunny, grinning, said, What you say, Chuck? With difficulty, Chuck said, Is his only motive for murdering his wife the fact that she's a shrew, that she browbeats him? No, Jones shouted, leaping up. You're right, we need a stronger motivation, and I think I've got it. There's this girl, Ziggy's got a mistress in the side. An interplan female spy, beautiful and sexy, you get it? And his wife won't give him a divorce, Dark said. Or maybe his wife has discovered this girl friend and has. Wait, Bunny said. What are we getting here? A psychological drama or a comedy skit? It's getting too messy. Right, Jones said, nodding. We stick to just showing what a monster the wife is. Anyhow, Ziggy sees this simulacrum he broke off because someone had entered the room. It was an Alphane, one of the race of chitinous creatures who a few years ago had been locked in combat with Terra, its multi-jointed arms and legs clicking, it scuttled toward Bunny, feeling with its antennae. The Alphanes were blind, and then touching him delicately, stroking Bunny's face, the Alphane turned and moved back satisfied that it was where it wished to be. Its eyeless head swiveled, and now it sniffed, picked up the presence of other humans. Am I interrupting? It asked in its twangy, harp-like voice, its alphane sing-song. I heard your discussion, and it interested me. Bunny said to Chuck, Rittersdorf, this is one of my oldest and dearest friends. I never trusted nobody the way I trust my buddy here. RBX 303, he explained. Maybe you don't know it, but Alphanes have license plate type names, sort of mechanical codes. That's all there is, just RBX 303. Sounds sort of impersonal. But Alf's 
are real warm-hearted. RBX-303 here has a heart of gold. He sniggered, two of them in fact, one on each side. I'm glad to meet you, Chuck said reflexively. The Alphane scrabbled up to him, stroked at his features. With its twin antennae, it was, Chuck decided, like having two houseflies run here and there across his face. A distinctly unpleasant impression. Mr. Rittersdorf, the Alphane twanged, delighted. It withdrew then. And who else is in this room, Bunny? I smell others. Just Dark and Jones, Bunny said, my writers. Again, turning to Chuck, he explained, RBX-303's a tycoon, a big wheeler and dealer in interplan commercial enterprises of every po sort. See, Chuck, here's the situation. RBX-303 here owns controlling stock in PubTrans Incorporated. Does that mean anything to you? For a moment, it meant nothing, and then it came to Chuck. PubTrans Incorporated was the company which sponsored Bunny Hentman's TV show. You mean, Chuck said, it's owned by... He broke off. He had started to say, owned by one of our former enemies. However, he did not say it. For one thing, it obviously was so. And for another... They were, after all, the former, not the present, enemy. Terra and the Alphanes were at peace, and the enmity was supposed to be over. You never met an Alf close up before, Bunny said acutely. You should, they're great people, sensitive with a terrific sense of humor. Pubtrans sponsors me partly because RBX-303 here personally believes in me and my talent. He did a lot to get me from being nothing but a comic doing the nightclub circuit with occasional guests on TV shows to having my own show, a show that's gone over partly because Pubtrans has done a hell of a good job publicizing it. I see, Chuck said. He felt ill, but he did not know quite why. Perhaps it was the whole situation. He could not understand it. Are Alphanes telepathic? He asked, knowing they weren't, and yet there seemed to be an uncanny awareness about this Alphane. Chuck had the intuition that it knew everything. There were no secrets which the Alphane could not seek out. They are not telepaths, Bunny said, but they depend on hearing a lot. That makes them different from us because we have eyes. He glanced at Chuck. What's with you and telepaths I mean, you must have known the answer. During the war, we were briefed up to our eyeballs about the enemy, and you're not too young to remember that. You must have grown up with it. Dark spoke up suddenly. I'll tell you what's bothering Rittersdorf. I used to feel the same way. Rittersdorf was hired for his ideas, and he doesn't want to see his brain picked clean. His ideas belong to him up until the moment he chooses to reveal them. If you brought in, say, a Ganymedean slime mold, hell, that would be an unfair invasion of all our personal rights. It would turn us into machines that you mechanically pumped for ideas. To Chuck, he said, don't worry about RBX-303. He can't read your thoughts. All he can do is very carefully listen to subtle, tiny nuances in what you say. 
but it's surprising how much he can detect that way. Alphanes make good psychologists. Seated in the next room, the Alphane said, reading Life magazine. I listened to your conversation about your new humorous character, Siegfried Trotz. Interested, I decided to come in. I put the audio tape down and arose. Is this satisfactory with all of you? Nobody minds your presence, Bunny assured. The Alphane. Nothing, the Alphane said, amuses and entertains and fascinates me as does a creative session by you gifted writers. Mr. Riddersdorf, I have never seen you in operation before, but already I can tell that you have a great deal to add. However, I sense your aversion, a very deeply held aversion, to the line which the conversation has taken. May I ask what precisely you find so objectionable to Siegfried Trotz and his desire to do away with his unpleasant wife? Are you married, Mr. Riddersdorf? Yes, Chuck said. Perhaps this plot idea rouses guilt feelings within you, the Alphane said thoughtfully. Perhaps you have unacknowledged hostile impulses toward your wife. Bunny said, You're way off, RBX. Chuck and his wife are splitting up. She's already gone into court. Anyway, Chuck's private life is his own business. We're not here... to dissect his psyche. Let's get back to the material. I still say, the Alphane declared, that there is something very unusual and atypical in Mr. Riddersdorf's reaction. I would like to find out why it turned its knob-like blind head toward Chuck. Perhaps if you and I see more of each other, I will find out why, and I have the feeling that knowing this would be of benefit to you too. Scratching his nose thoughtfully, Bunny Hintman said, Maybe he does know, RBX, maybe he just doesn't want to say. He eyed Chuck and said, I still say it's his own business in either case. Chuck said, it simply doesn't sound like a comedy idea to me. That's the extent of my, he had almost said, a version of my doubts. Well, I don't have any doubts, Bunny decided. I'll have our prop department put together a hollow simulacrum type figure that somebody can get into. That'll be a lot cheaper and more reliable than buying a genuine one, and we'll need some girl to play the role of Ziggy's wife. My wife, because I'll be Ziggy. How about the girlfriend, Jones, said, is that in or not? Dark said, it would have one advantage. We could have her breast heavy, you know, frack. That would please a lot of viewers. Otherwise, we're stuck with one shrewish type woman who decidedly would not be breast heavy. That kind never gets that operation performed. You got someone particular in mind who could play that part. Bunny asked him, pad of paper and pen in hand. You know that new fray your agent's handling, Dark said. That fresh little one, Patty something, Patty Weaver, she's really breast heavy. The medics must have grafted in 50 pounds if it's an ounce. I'll sign up Patty tonight, Bunny Hintman said, nodding. I know her and she's good. 
she's exactly right for it. And then we need some bellicose old hag to play the shrewish wife. Maybe I'll let Chuck do the casting select for that. He laughed owlishly. Chapter 8 When late that night, Chuck Rittersdorf wearily returned to his rundown Connaught in Marin County, California. He was stopped in the hall by the yellow Ganymedian slime mold. This at 3 a.m. It was too much. There are a pair of individuals in your act. Lord Running Clam informed him. It seemed to me you should be tipped off in advance. Thanks, Chuck said, and wondered what he had to cope with now. One of them is your superior at CIA, the slime mold said, Jack Elwood. The second is Mr. Elwood's superior, a Mr. Roger London. They are here to interrogate you as to your other job. I never concealed it from them, Chuck said. In fact, Mageboom, operated by Pete Petri, was right here on the spot. When Hentman hired me, uneasily he wondered why they considered it their affair. True, the slime mold agreed, but you see, they had a tap on the vid line over which you talked this evening, first to Joan Triest, and then to Mr. Hentman in Florida. So not only do they know that you're working for Mr. Hentman, but they also know the script idea which you, that explained it, he passed on by the slime mold to the door of his apt. It was unlocked. He opened it, faced the two CIA men. This late in the night, he said, it's that important. Going to the closet, it was the ancient style manual variety. He hung up his coat. The apt was comfortably warm. The CIA officials had turned on the non-thermostatically controlled radiant heat. Is this the man, London said. He was a tall, stooped, graying man <clears throat> in his late fifties. Chuck had run into him. A few times and had found him difficult. This is Rittersdorf. Yes, Elwood said. Chuck, listen carefully. There are facts about Bunny Hentman you don't know. Security facts. Now we are aware of the reason why you accepted this job. We know you didn't want to, but were forced to. Oh, Chuck said warily, they couldn't possibly know what pressure the telepathic slime mold across the hall had put on him. Elwood said, we fully recognize your difficult situation regarding your ex-wife Mary, the enormous settlement and alimony payments which she was able to obtain. We know you need the money in order to meet those payments. However, he glanced at London. London nodded, and Elwood bent to unzip his briefcase. I have Hentman's dossier here. His real name is Sam Little. During the war, he was convicted on a charge of violating the trade rules governing commerce with neutral states. In other words, Hentman supplied needed commodities to the enemy by way of an intermediate source. He spent only one year in prison. However, he had a very good choir of attorneys. You want to hear more? Yes, Chuck said. 
because I can hardly quit my job on the grounds that 15 years ago, all right, Elwood said, after a further exchange of glances with his superior, London, after the war, Sam Little, or Bunny Hentman, as he now is known, lived in the Alpha system. What he did there, no one knows. Our data-gathering sources were of no use to us in Alpha-held territory. Anyhow, about six years ago, he returned to Terra, and with plenty of interplan skins, he began doing a comedy routine in nightclubs, and then Pub Trans Incorporated sponsored him. I know, Chuck interrupted, that an Alphane owns Pub Trans. I met him, RBX 303. You met him? Both Elwood and London stared at him. Do you know anything about RBX 303? Elwood demanded. His family, during the war, controlled the largest war goods combine in the Alpha system. His brother is in the Alphane cabinet right now, directly responsible to the Alphane doji. In other words, when you're dealing with RBX 303, you're dealing with the Alphane government. He tossed the dossier to Chuck. Read the rest. Chuck glanced through the neatly typed pages. It was easy to make out the summary at the end. The CIA agents who had compiled the dossier believed that RBX 303 was acting as an untitled rep of a foreign power and that Hintman was aware of this. Therefore, their activities were being watched by the CIA. His reason for giving you the job, Elwood said, is not what you think. Hentman doesn't need another writer. He's already got five. I'll tell you our opinion. We think it has to do with your wife. Chuck said nothing. He continued, vacantly, to pour over the sheets which made up the dossier. The Alphanes, Elwood said, would like to reacquire Alpha 3 M2, and the only way they can do it legally is to induce the Terrans inhabiting it to leave. Otherwise, according to Interplan law, the protocols of 2040 come into effect. The moon becomes the property of its settlers and since those settlers are Terran, it's indirectly the property of Terra. The Alphanes can't make the settlers leave, but they've kept an eye on them. They're perfectly aware that it's a society made up of former, former mental patients of the Harry Stack Sullivan Neuropsychiatric Hospital, which we established there before the war. The only agency that could get those settlers off Alpha 3 M2 would be Terran, either Turplin or the U.S. Interplan Health and Welfare Service. We could conceivably evacuate the moon, and that would leave it up for grabs. But no one, Chuck said, is going to recommend that the settlers be evacuated. It seemed to him entirely out of the question. One of two things would occur. Either Terra would leave the settlers strictly alone, or a new hospital would be built, and the settlers would be coerced into entering it. Elwood said, You may be right, but do the Alphanes know that? And remember, London said in his hoarse, low voice, The Alphanes are great gamblers. The entire war was one great long shot for them. 
and they lost, they don't know any other way to operate. That was true, Chuck nodded, and yet it still made no sense. What influence did he have over Mary's decisions? Hentman knew that he and Mary were legally separated. Mary was on Alpha 3M2, and he was here on Terra. And even if they were both on the Alphane Moon, Mary would never listen to him. Her decision would be her own. Yet, if the Alphanes knew that he had control of the Daniel Mageboom simulacrum, he simply couldn't believe that they knew this. It was impossible. We have a theory, Elwood said, retrieving the dossier and returning it to his briefcase. We believe that the Alphanes know, don't tell me, Chuck said, that they know about Mageboom. That would mean they'd penetrated the CIA. I wasn't going to say quite that, Elwood said uncomfortably. I was going to say that they know, just as we do, that your separation from Mary is purely legal, that you are still as emotionally involved with her as ever. As reconstructed by us, their view comes out like this. Contact between you and Mary will shortly be resumed, whether either of you anticipates it or not. And what good will that do them, Chuck said. Here, their concept of the situation becomes positively lurid, Elwood said. Now, this we've picked up strictly from peripheral indications, from snatches gathered here and there. We may be wrong, but it appears that the Alphanes are going to try to induce you to make an attempt to kill your wife. Chuck said nothing. He kept his features immobile. Time passed. No one spoke. Elwood and Roger London regarded him curiously, tangibly wondering why he did not respond. To be honest with you, London growled finally. We have an informant in Hintman's immediate staff, never mind who. This informant tells us that the script idea which Hintman and his writers presented you on your arrival in Florida had to do with a CIA simulacrum killing a woman, a man's wife. The man is a CIA agent. Is that correct? Chuck nodded. Slowly, his eyes fixed on a spot on the wall to the right of Elwood in London. This plot situation, London continued, is supposed to give you the idea of trying to kill Miss Rittersdorf with a CIA sim. What Hindman and his Alphane buddies don't know, of course, is that a CIA sim is already on Alpha 3M2 and that you're operating it. If they did know this, they would. He broke off, then said slowly to himself, then they'd see there's no need to build an elaborate script up to give you the idea. He studied Chuck, because very possibly you already have thought of it. After a pause, Elwood said, that's an interesting speculation. I hadn't come on to it myself, but eventually I would. To Chuck, he said, would you like to give up your operation of the Mageboom Simulacrum to prove beyond a doubt that you had no such action in mind? Chuck said, picking his words with care, of course, I won't give it up. It was obvious that if he did, he would be admitting that they were right, that they had uncovered something about him and his intentions. And, in addition, he did not care to relinquish the Mage Boom task for a very good reason. He wanted to continue his plan for killing Mary. If anything should happen to Miss Rittersdorf, London said, in view of this, great suspicion would fall on you. 
I realized that, Chuck said, woodenly, so, while you're operating that mage boom sem, London said, you better see to it that it protects Miss Rittersdorf. Chuck said, you want my frank opinion. Certainly, London said, and Elwood nodded. This whole thing is an absurdity, a concoction based on isolated data by some imaginative agent in the field, someone who evidently has hung around TV personalities too long. How is my killing Mary going to alter her decision regarding Alpha 3 M2 and its psychotic settlers? If she's dead, she'd simply be replaced, and someone else would make the determination. I think Elwood said, speaking to his superior, that what we are going to find ourselves dealing with here is not a murder, but an attempted murder. Murder as a threat held over Dr. Rittersdorf's head to make her comply, he added, speaking to Chuck, that of course is assuming that Hentman's campaign bears fruit, that you're influenced by the logic put forth by the TV script. But you seem to think I would be, Chuck said. I think, Elwood said, that it's an interesting coincidence that you are operating a CIA simulacrum in Mary's vicinity, exactly as Hentman's script proposes. What are the chances? Chuck said a more plausible explanation is that somehow Hentman has found out I'm operating the Mage Boom simulacrum, that he developed his idea from the situation. And you know what that means. The implication was obvious. Despite their denials, the CIA had been penetrated, or there existed one other possibility. Lord Running Clam had picked up the facts from Chuck's mind and had conveyed them to Bunny Hentman. First, the slime mold had blackmailed him into taking the job with Hentman, and now all of them were acting together to blackmail him into fulfilling their plan for Alpha 3 M2. The TV script was not designed to put the idea of killing Mary into his mind. By means of the slime mold, the Hentman organization knew the idea was already there. The TV script was to tell him indirectly but clearly that they knew, and unless he did as they directed, it would be telecast manifestly to the entire soul system. Seven billion people would know about his plans for killing his wife. It was, he had to admit, a compelling reason for his stringing along with the Hentman organization to do what they wanted, they rather had him. Look what they had accomplished already. They had made high officials in the West Coast branch of the CIA suspicious, and, as London had said, if anything happened to Mary, and yet he still intended to go through with it, or rather, to try to go through with it, and not just as a threat, as the Hentman organization wanted, to coerce Mary into advocating a certain policy regarding the psychotic settlers. It was his intention to go all the way, as he had originally planned. Why he did not know, after all, he did not have to see her any more, live with her. Why did her death seem so vital to him? Oddly, Mary might be the only person who could poke into his mind, 
if she were given the chance, and discover his motives, it was her job. The irony pleased him, and despite the proximity of the two astute CIA officials, not to mention the ever-present yellow slime mold eavesdropping on the far side of the hall, he did not feel badly at all. He was, witwise, confronting two distinct factions, both of them experienced, the CIA and the Hentman organization, consisted of old-time pros, and yet he felt, intuitively, that ultimately he would obtain what he wanted, not what they wanted. The slime mold, of course, would be overhearing his thought. He hoped that it would carry it back to Hentman. He wanted Hentman to know. As soon as the two CIA officials had left, the slime mold flowed under the locked door to his apt, materialized in the center of the old-fashioned wall-to-wall carpeting. It spoke accusingly with a ring of righteous indignation. Mr. Rittersdorf, I assure you, I had no contact with Mr. Hentman. I never saw him before that night, recently, when he came here to obtain your signature on a job contract. You rascals, Chuck said as he fixed himself coffee in the kitchen. The time was now past four o'clock. However, thanks to the illegal stimulants which Lord Running Clam had provided him, he felt no fatigue. Always listening in, he said. Don't you have a life of your own? The slime mold said. I agree with you on one point, Mr. Hentman. Is in preparing that script, must have known your intentions toward your wife. Otherwise, the coincidence is just too great to be acceptable. Perhaps someone, Mr. Rittersdorf, is a telepath. Someone in addition to me. Chuck glanced at him. It could be a fellow employee at CIA, the slime mold said. Or it could be taking place while you are in the Mage Boom Simulacrum on Alpha 3 M2. One of the psychotic settlers there might be a telepath. I conceive it to be my job from now on to assist you to every extent possible in order to palpably demonstrate my good faith. I am desperately anxious to clear my good name in your eyes. I'll do all I can to find this telepath <clears throat> who has gone to Hentman. Thus, could it be Joan Triest? Chuck interrupted suddenly. No, I'm familiar with her mind. It has no such powers. She is a psi, as you know, but her talent deals with time. The slime mold pondered. Unless you know, Mr. Rittersdorf, there is another way by which your intentions could be known. That would be the psionic power of precognition, assuming that one day, eventually, your scheme becomes public. A precog, looking ahead, might see this, possess this knowledge now, that is an idea we must not overlook. At least it proves that the telepathic factor is not the sole item which would account for Hentman's knowledge of what you intend to do vis-a-vis -vis your wife. He had to admit that there was merit in the slime mold's logic. In fact, the slime mold said, pulsing visibly with agitation. It could be the involuntary functioning of a precog talent by someone close to you who does not even know he possesses it. Someone, for example, in the Hentman organization. Even Mr. Hentman himself. Hmm, Chuck said absently as he filled his cup with hot coffee. 
your future life track, the slime mold said, is filled with spectacular violence of your murder of the woman you fear and hate. This enormous spectacle may have activated the latent precog talent of Mr. Hentman, and without knowing what he was drawing, <clears throat> drawing from, he had the inspiration for this script idea. Often, psionic talents function in this very way. The more I think of it, the more I am. Convinced that this is precisely what occurred. Hence, I would say that your CIA people's theory is valueless. Hintman and his Alphane colleague do not mean to confront you with any so-called evidence of your intentions. They are simply doing as they say, attempting to concoct a workable TV script. What about the CIA's contention that the Alphanes are interested in acquiring Alpha 3 M2, Chuck said. Possibly that portion is so, the slime mold conceded. It would be typical of the Alphanes not to give up, to keep hoping. After all, the moon is in their system, but frankly, may I so speak, your CIA people's theory strikes me as a miserable bundle of random suspicions, a few separate facts strung together by an intricate structure of ad hoc theorizing, in which everyone is credited with enormous powers for intrigue. A much simpler view can be entertained with more common sense. And as a CIA employee, you must be aware of that. Like all intelligence agencies, it lacks the faculty of common sense. Chuck shrugged. In fact, the slime mold said, if I may say so, your colorful desire for vengeance on your wife is in part derived from your years of hanging around intelligence apparatus personnel. You will admit one thing, though, Chuck said. It's colossal bad luck for me that Hintman and his writers have hit upon that particular idea for their TV script. Bad luck but rather amusing in that you personally will soon be sitting down to do the dialogue for this script. The slime mold chuckled. Perhaps you can infuse it with authenticity. Hintman will be delighted with your insight into Ziggy Trot's motivations. How did you know the character is to be named Ziggy Trot's? At once he was again suspicious. It's in your mind. Then it must also be in my mind that I'd like you to leave so I can be alone. He did not feel sleepy. However, he felt like sitting down and starting on the TV script. By all means, the slime mold flowed off. And presently, Chuck was alone in the act. The only sound arose from the meager traffic in the street below. He stood at the window, drinking his cup of coffee for a little while, and then he seated himself at his typewriter and pressed the button, which raised a sheet of blank paper into position. Ziggy trots, he thought, with aversion. Christ! What a name! What kind of person does it suggest? An idiot like one of the three stooges. Someone defective enough, he thought acidly, to dwell on the concept of murdering his wife. He began with professional canniness to conjure up the initial scene. It, of course, would be Ziggy at home, 
trying peacefully to do some harmless task. Perhaps Ziggy was reading the evening homeopate, and, like some harpy, his wife would be there, giving him the business. Yes, Chuck thought, I can supply verisimilitude to this scene. I can draw on years of experience. He began to type. For several hours he wrote, marveling at the efficiency of the illegal hexoamphetamine stimulants. He felt no fatigue. In fact, he worked more swiftly than he had been his custom in times past. At 7.30, with the street outside touched by the long golden rays of the morning sun, he rose stiffly, walked into the kitchen, and began to prepare himself breakfast. Now for my other job, he said to himself. At 8.30, off to the CIA building in San Francisco and Daniel Mageboom. Piece of toast in hand, he stood by the typewriter, glancing over the pages which he had written. They looked good, and dialogue to be spoken had been his trade for years. Now, to air express them to Hentman in New York, they would be in the comic's hands within an hour. At twenty minutes after eight, as he was shaving in the bathroom, he heard the vidphone ring, his first call since having it installed. Going to it, he switched it on. Hello? On the tiny screen, a girl's face formed, stunningly beautiful Irish features. He blinked. Mr. Riddersdorf, I'm Patricia Weaver. I just learned that Bunny Hentman wants me for a script you're doing. I wondered if I could see a copy. I'm dying to look it over. For simply years, I've prayed for a chance to be on Bunny's program. I just admire it to hell and back. Naturally, he had a Thermofax copying machine. He could run off any number of duplicates of the script. I'll send you what I have, but it's not done, and Bunny hasn't seen it to okay it. I don't know how much he'll want to keep. Maybe none. From the way Bunny talked about you, Patricia Weaver said, I'm sure he'll use all of it. Could you do that? I'll give you my address. Actually, I'm not far from you at all. You're up in Northern California, and I'm down in L.A., in Santa Monica. We could get together. Would you like that? And you could listen to me read my part of the script. Her part, good grief, he realized. He hadn't written any dialogue that included her. The slinky, breast-heavy, nipple-dilated female intelligence agent. He had only done scenes between Ziggy Trotz and his shrewish wife. There was only one solution, to take a half-day leave of absence from his CIA job, sit here in the Conapt and write more dialogue. I'll tell you what, he said. I'll bring a copy down to you. Give me until this evening. He found a pen and paper. Let's have your address. The hell with the mage boom simulacrum. In view of this, he had never witnessed such an attractive girl in his life. All at once, everything else had become mediocre. Hurled back into proper perspective. He got the girl's address, shakily hung up the vidphone, then at once packaged up the pages of the script for Bunny Hentman. On his way to San Francisco, he put the envelope in the Rocket Express mail, and that was that. While he worked at his CIA job, he probably could dream up dialogue for Miss Weaver. 
by dinner time he would be ready to get it down on paper and by eight o'clock he would have the actual pages to show her. Things, he decided, are not going so badly after all. Certainly, this is a vast improvement over my nightmarish life with Mary. He reached the CIA building on Sansom Street in San Francisco and started to enter by the wide, familiar gate. Rittersdorf, a voice said, Please come into my office. It was Roger London, large and grimly sullen, eyeing him with displeasure. More talk, Chuck asked himself as he followed London to his office. Mr. Rittersdorf, London said, as soon as the door had shut, We bugged your conapt last night. We know what you did after we left. What did I do? For the life of him, he could not remember having done anything that would arouse the CIA, unless in his conversation with the slime mold he had said too much. The Ganymedian's thoughts, of course, would be imperceptible to the monitoring device. All that he could remember having uttered himself was some remark that it was a colossal piece of bad luck that the TV script idea, which Hentman wanted written, had to do with a man murdering his wife by means of a CIA sim, and surely that. London said, You were up the balance of the night, working. That would be impossible unless you had access to drugs currently banned on Terra. Therefore, you have non-T contacts, which are supplying you with the drugs. And, in view of this, he studied Chuck. You're temporarily suspended from your job as a security risk. Stunned, Chuck said, but to hold both my jobs. Any CIA employee foolish enough to make use of illegal non-T stimulant drugs can't possibly be capable of fulfilling his task here, London said. As of today, the Mage Boom Simulacrum will be operated by a team consisting of Pete Petrie and a man you don't know, Tom Schneider. London's coarse features twisted into a mocking smile. You still have your other job, or do you? What do you mean, or do I? Of course, he still had his job with Hintman. They had signed a contract. London said, If CIA's theory is correct, Hintman will have no use for you the moment he learns that you've been denied access to the Mage Boom Simulacrum. So, I would say that in roughly 12 hours, London examined his wristwatch. That say, by 9 tonight, You'll discover the unpleasant fact that you have no employment at all, and then I think you'll be a trifle more cooperative with us. You'll be glad to revert to your former status of holding one job here, period. London opened his office door, ushering Chuck out. By the way, he continued, would you care to name your source of supply of your drugs. I deny taking any illegal drugs, Chuck said, but even in his own ears, it did not sound convincing. London had him, and they both knew it. Why not simply cooperate with us? London inquired. Give up your job with Hentman, name your supplier, you could have access to the Mage Boom Simulacrum in 15 minutes. I can personally range it. What reason do you have for? The money, Chuck said. I need the money from both jobs. And I'm being blackmailed, he said to himself, by Lord Running Clam. But he couldn't say that. Not to London. 
Okay, London said, you may go. Get in touch with us when you've seen your way clear to drop your job with Hentman. Perhaps we can settle on just that one stipulation. He held the office door open for Chuck. Dazed, Chuck found himself on the wide front stairs of the CIA building. It seemed incredible, and yet it had happened. He had lost his job of many years, and on what seemed to him a pretext. Now he had no way to reach Mary. The hell with the loss of salary, his income from the Hentman organization, more than made up that. But without the use <clears throat> of the Mage Boom Simulacrum, he could not expect to carry out his plan, which he had obviously delayed too long anyhow, and in the vacuum left by the disappearance of this anticipation. He felt a powerful sinking emptiness inside him. His entire raison d'etre had all at once evaporated. He started numbly back up the stairs once more toward the main gate of the CIA building. A uniformed guard at once materialized out of nowhere and blocked his way. Mr. Rittersdorf, I'm sorry I regret, but I've been given order. You see not to admit you. Chuck said, I want to see Mr. London again. For a minute, using his portable intercom, the guard put through a call. All right, Mr. Rittersdorf, you may proceed to Mr. London's office. He then stepped aside, and the turnstile flew automatically open for Chuck. A moment later, he once more faced London in the man's large wood-paneled office. You reached a decision. Have you? London asked. I have a point to make. If Hentman doesn't fire me, wouldn't that be de facto proof that your suspicions of him were incorrect? He waited while London scowled, scowled but did not answer. If Hentman does not fire me, Chuck said, I'm going to appeal your decision to bar me from my job. I'm going before the Civil Service Commission and show that. You're barred from your job, London said smoothly, because of your use of illegal drugs. To be blunt, we've already searched your CONAPT and found them. It's GB40 that you're on, isn't it? You can maintain a 24-hour-a-day work schedule indefinitely on GB40. Congratulations. However, now that you no longer have your position here with us, being able to work around the clock hardly seems a benefit. So, lots of luck, he walked off, seated himself at his desk, and picked up a document. The interview was at an end. But you'll know you were wrong, Chuck said, when Hentman doesn't fire me. All I ask is that you rethink the situation once that's occurred. Goodbye. He left the office, closing the door noisily behind him. Goodbye, for Lord knows how long, he said to himself. Once more outdoors, on the early morning sidewalk, he stood uncertainly, buffeted by the hordes of people pushing by. Now what? he asked himself. His life, for the second time in a month, had been inverted. First, the shock of the separation from Mary, now this. Too much, he said to himself, and wondered if there was anything left. The Hentman job was left, and only the Hentman job. 
By autonomic cab, he returned to his conapt and quickly, in fact, desperately seated himself at his typewriter. Now, he said to himself, to do dialogue for Miss Weaver. He forgot everything else, narrowing his world to the dimensions of the typewriter with its sheet of paper. I'll give you a damn good part, he reflected, and maybe I'll get something back in exchange. He began to work, and by three that afternoon, he had finished. He rose creakily, stretched, and felt the weariness of his body, but his mind was lucid. So they bugged my apt, he said to himself, with both audio and video aids, aloud for the benefit of the tap, he said, those bastards at the office spying on me, pathological. Frankly, it's a relief to be out of that atmosphere of suspicion. And he ceased. What was the use? He went into the kitchen and fixed lunch. At four, dressed in his best titanian Ruselweave blue and black suit, powdered, shaved, and dabbed with such masculine scents as only the modern chemistry lab could produce, he set off on foot, seeking a jet cab, the manuscript under his arm. He was on his way to Santa Monica and Patty Weaver's Conapt, too, heaven only knew, but he had great hopes. If this fell through, then what? A good question, and one he hoped he would not have to answer. He had lost too much already. The structure of his world had undergone an insidious process of truncation by the loss of his wife and his traditional job. Both in such a short period, he felt bewilderment within his percept system. It expected to see Mary at night and the San Francisco CIA office by day. Now it encountered neither. Something would have to occupy his void. His senses craved it. He flagged down a jet cab and gave it the Santa Monica address of Patty Weaver. Then, sitting back against the seat, he got out the pages of dialogue and began going over them for last-minute small alterations. An hour later, slightly after five o'clock, the cab began to descend to the roof field of Patty Weaver's remarkably handsome large and stylish new Conapt building. This is the big time, Chuck said to himself, hobnobbing with a breast-heavy TV starlet. What more could he ask? The cab landed, a little unsteadily. Chuck got out the fare.